James Bond is back and up to his usual hijinks, this time in India in Octopussy, the 13th Bond movie. Octopussy is one of four new films we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And I'm Neil Gabler. In addition to Octopussy, we'll also be looking at Saturday Night Live's old star, Dan Aykroyd, teaming up with the show's new star, Eddie Murphy, in a new comedy called Trading Places, and at the Spanish melodrama that won this year's Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film. That one is called To Begin Again. But Jeffrey will start with the sequel to a classic thriller. The film is Psycho 2. Indeed, here we go, get ready. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the Bates Motel, Norman is back. You remember Norman from Psycho, one of Sir Alfred Hitchcock's most famous films, with his eerie mother fixation, and Norman's penchant for mayhem with a kitchen knife. Well, 23 years after Psycho opened to terrible reviews, but great box office business, Psycho 2 has arrived. Norman, once again, of course played by Anthony Perkins, has spent those years in a mental institution for committing seven murders. And here he's in a courtroom with his psychiatrist, about to be released. On the basis of the staff report, Norman Bates is judged, restored to sanity, and is ordered released forthwith. What about his victims? Don't they have any say? Can you restore them? Madam, please sit down. This matter is being represented by the district attorney. Your Honor, my name is Mrs. Lila Loomis. I have a petition here signed by 743 people against Norman Bates' release, including the relatives of the seven people he murdered. Doesn't that give me the right to speak out? Has the district attorney advised Mrs. Loomis about her rights in this matter? Yes, Your Honor. I explained that her petition had no effect on these proceedings. Have you explained to her that this hearing is Why a matter of law and not a motion? Don't you realize yes, they're going to release a homeless Mrs. Loomis, I'm going to ask you to sit down or I'll have the bailiff remove you from this courtroom. If you have any further questions, please discuss them with the district attorney after this hearing. Why bother? It's all too obvious. Our courts protect the criminals, not their victims. That was Vera Miles, who was also in the original Psycho, protesting Norman's release, and with good reason. For Norman may still have some nasty habits when it comes to cutlery. In this scene, for instance, he innocently has a light dinner with a young woman he's just befriended and invited to spend the night in a spare room at the friendly Bates Motel. But this is yours. No, go ahead. You, you have it. I'll make myself another. Do you have a knife? No, I'm afraid. I don't. I... I just moved back here after being many years away, and I forgot to bring any cutlery. That's odd. People usually leave something, even if it is only an old butter knife. Ah, there. Going to eat? No, I, I, I just suddenly lost my appetite. But you, you, you go ahead, enjoy it. I guess I'm like you. I, I suddenly lost my appetite too. Can't blame her, can you? Just as in the original Psycho, someone's been killing again in Psycho 2, and Norman's mother, furthermore, has been calling him. But Psycho 2 is just trying to be more of the same and nothing can convey the stark horror Hitchcock created in the original. Psycho 2 has none of the sensation of impending terror, nor Hitchcock's message that in all of us there is the potential for evil. Psycho 2, with its rather obvious plot and easy-to-detect killer, is just a campy homage to Hitchcock by young director Richard Franklin. Tony Perkins is chilling as Norman Bates in the best role of his career, but it's all so familiar, you'll be too busy laughing at the references to the original film to be really scared. Psycho 2 just makes you miss Hitchcock and Psycho 1. I disagree with you, Jeffrey. I think this film has the good sense not to try to compete with Psycho 1. What it really is is a high-class drive-in movie. And I judge it by how well it creates suspense. And it creates suspense very, very well. And, and, and the main suspense is, will Norman pick up that knife and commit murder again? And that question keeps you going through about half the movie. And in the second half of the movie, there's another question. 
that rises. Once murders have been committed, has Norman done them? And if not, is somebody trying to frame Norman? Couldn't you so figure that out? I could figure, I'm not even good at that usually, and I could figure it out here. It all looked like a setup to me, filmed on the back lot. Of all places to go back, the house that spawned all those murders, and victims seem to be coming just to be killed, showing up just to be killed. Well, that's the, the nature you, of these movies. Well, Again, not Psycho, that's the nature of, No, not, not Psycho. Psycho. The original thing about Psycho that made it so great was that the terror was sudden, unexpected. Janet Lee, a major character, was suddenly killed, and it was also suggested you didn't see any of the murders. Here, towards the end of the picture, you actually see it. Maybe we've come a long way in that type of picture since then, but that annoyed me, too, about it. But Psycho is a different kind of movie than this film. This is really a traditional suspense drive-in Saturday night film. Well, and on that level, it does work because, one, it, again, it creates that sense of suspense. And two, as you said, Anthony Perkins is really very good. And he plays this film very straight. So he has you rooting for him. He really gets your sympathy. Oddly enough, who would ever think that Norman Bates would get our sympathy? But he does in this film. He's the best thing. But if you call it Psycho 2, it begs comparison to the original. And I thought it failed in that respect. Okay, I disagree with you. Well, our next film is called Trading Places, and it's a rather tame comedy that combines the talents of Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. In Trading Places, Aykroyd plays a successful young commodities broker who works for two stingy old brothers. Now, the brothers have begun debating whether it's heredity or environment, your genes or your surroundings that determine your fate, and they decide to conduct a little experiment. <laughs> they frame Aykroyd so that he loses his job and all his possessions and the brothers replace him with an uneducated street hustler played by Eddie Murphy. Now, in this scene, a suspicious Murphy gets his first taste of the good life. <laughs> Say, man, who are y'all? What y'all want with me? Now, we want to help you, Mr. Valentine. My brother and I run a privately funded program to rehabilitate culturally disadvantaged people. We'd like to supply you with a home of your own, a car, a generous bank account, and employment with our company. We're going to start you at $80,000 a year. $80,000? Mm. Excuse me. This is a practical joke, right, Brian? And these dudes a couple of man, huh? Well, what's my next move, man? Thank you, you've been heavy. What about the police and the payroll? We've had the charges dropped, Mr. Valentine. You're a free man, Valentine. We can stop right now and you can walk out on us forever. Uh, no. No, I believe I can hang out with you fellas for a little while. Excellent. Yeah. I'm Randolph Duke. How you doing, Randy? What's happening? My younger brother, Mortimer. Hey, Marte, what it is? <laughs> what it is? <laughs> Billy Ray Valentine, Capricorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Murphy there takes Aykroyd's old job and moves into Aykroyd's old house, the brothers have Aykroyd thrown into jail on a trumped-up robbery and drug charge. Then, when his socialite fiancé comes to bail him out, Aykroyd gets another little surprise that the brothers have cooked up. Stealing from your friends at the club, Lewis? Heroin, Lewis? Have you lost your mind? Mother wants me to call off the wedding, and so does Todd. Todd? What does Todd have to do with it? You've been fired from Duke and Duke. They're preparing charges against you for embezzlement. Embezzlement? I've never stolen anything in my life. Listen, Penelope, I swear to you, on my honor, with almighty God as my witness, I am not an angel dust dealer. Oh, Lewis. Oh. I've been looking everywhere for you, baby. Listen, Lewis, it's you. I'm hurting, baby. I just need a shot. Please. Lewis, who is this person? I've never seen this woman before in my life. Don't say that. Come on, baby. Just a dime bag. You lying, filthy, disgusting creep! Grand. Great. Thanks a lot. It was a joke. Your friend said it would get you off. You mean someone told you to do this to me? 
And he paid me a hundred bucks, too. It's right over there. Well, poor Dan Aykroyd, in more ways than one. Because in Trading Places, it's Eddie Murphy who confirms that he's a star. Murphy has the natural gift to make you laugh at anything he does. And when he's on screen, the whole movie crackles. But Murphy doesn't get much help. The pace of Trading Places is all wrong. It's way too slow for a comedy. Each scene seems drawn out, and the jokes have been rationed, one to a scene. There's no spark. You want this film to cut loose the way Aykroyd and Murphy can. You want it to get a little wild and crazy instead of staying so sedate and plotting. Trading Places has some inspired moments, again, mainly Murphy's, but I was never laughing as much as the movie wanted me to. Well, I agree with you. There are problems here, Neil, but I think Eddie Murphy can make even mediocre material wonderful, and I thought Aykroyd was fine, too. Funny enough, sure, the middle of the movie slows down, and you're right about the pacing, but boy, Eddie it's Murphy... very poorly timed. But Eddie Murphy is such a natural talent, such a rare talent, that he can lift this movie and make it funny, and I laughed almost throughout the whole picture, despite its flaws. I laughed when Murphy was on screen, and I was hoping that they would team up Aykroyd and Murphy. Unfortunately, they're not on screen together very often until the very end of the movie, and the end of the movie, I have to admit, is very upbeat, it's very satisfying. I have a feeling that many members of the audience will leave this film saying, that was a very fun picture. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that at all, but the last ten movies the, uh, the last 10 minutes of the picture should not make you forget the other two hours of the picture that are very slow, one joke per scene, very low-key, very poorly timed. It's a flat comedy. And there's nothing worse me. in a comedy than flatness. One joke per scene from Eddie Murphy is, in this case, good enough for me. I think he's brilliant, and I disagree with you on this. Yes movie. to Murphy, no to trading places. Disagree That's the way I you. feel. Let's go on to something entirely different, a picture called To Begin Again, or as it's called in Spanish, Volver a Empezar. Now, this picture won the Oscar this year for Best Foreign Language Film. Set mostly in the small Spanish city of Gijón, it's about a writer who's just won the Nobel Prize, but it was learned he's dying of cancer. He returns to his native city, where he hasn't been since 1938, when he fled the Spanish Civil War. He rekindles a long-lost romance, and here, the man recalls the short time he's just spent with his old sweetheart. <laughs> To Begin Again is a gentle movie about an interrupted generation, people whose lives were torn asunder by the Spanish Civil War and who tried to pick up and start over again when the war ended. But it's bland, undramatic, and unemotional. The characters are standard and uninteresting. And the situation, that is a dying man seeing old friends and recalling happier times, cries out to be moving. To Begin Again won the Oscar, but I'm still wondering how. I couldn't agree more with you. This, this film never even begins to work for me because, for one thing, I never feel that there's anything really between this man and this old flame of his. You never get the feeling that they had a very passionate relationship. Why didn't he return for her? Why didn't he have her come to America? These are unanswered questions. Why did it take 38 years for these two people to get, to, to get back together again if they were so passionately yeah. in love with she one She doesn't another? even recognize him at first. You know, I spent, a, <laughs> I spent right. a lot of time in Spain. I know that little city. I expected a real Spanish flavor here, a Spanish outlook on life. And there's not even that. You're left saying, so what? Nothing is done with these characters. It's really a shame. It was a major disappointment for me. There wasn't a wet eye in the place. It wasn't an open eye in the place. <laughs> well, let's move on, Jeffrey. Our next film is Octopussy, the latest adventure of British agent 007, James Bond. 
This time, as if it makes any difference, Bond is assigned <laughs> to discover why priceless Russian art objects are suddenly being sold on the art market. Following clues, Bond, played by Roger Moore, tracks an unscrupulous art dealer to a backgammon casino in India. And here, the super suave British agent meets the equally suave villain, played by Louis Jordan. Now, Jordan has just been on a winning streak with the help of some loaded dice. I can't accept. Not with your luck. You win. Well, I would have taken that double myself. Then uh, why don't you take over the Major's position? Uh, Mr. Bond. James Bond. Thank you, I'd be delighted. Do you have the cash? Well, I think that this should be ample security. Hmm. Play, Mr. Bond. You need a great deal of luck to get out of this. Oh, luck. But well, then I shall use player's privilege and use your lucky dice. It's all in the wrist. Double sixes. I prefer cash. Get it cashed for him. Yes, sir. Spend the money quickly, Mr. Bond. I intend to. The trail leads from Jordan to what else? A beautiful jewel smuggler named Octopussy. I'm not for hire. Oh, a man of principle with a price on his head. Naturally, you do it for queen and country. I have no country. I have no price on my head. I don't have to apologize to you, a paid assassin, for what I am. Did you ever notice that James Bond is like a walking aphrodisiac? <laughs> <laughs> well, after numerous battles with Jordan's men, Bond discovers that the jewels are really just an elaborate cover for a far more deadly scheme. A renegade Russian general, in partnership with Jordan, is using the lovely octopusy to smuggle a nuclear warhead. And only James Bond can stop it. That's why you go to a James Bond movie, right? Right. Well, by now, Bond movies are practically indistinguishable from one another. In Octopussy, only the locations, the villains, and the women's faces have changed. The plot is indistinguishable, too. It's just a flimsy excuse to get from one action scene to another, and the action sequences are like fireworks displays. They're individually exciting, but they don't seem to have much relationship to one another. The surprise is that in Octopussy, all this old nonsense still works even if the movie isn't anywhere near as fast and as light as some of the earlier Bonds. What you want from James Bond is a little sex, a few hairbreadth escapes, and loads of action. That's not much to ask, and Octopussy delivers.
It certainly does. You know, in my mind, you mentioned indistinguishable plots. All the Roger Moore James Bond movies are almost alike in my mind as I think of them, and all the Sean Connery ones have a distinctive identity. But that aside, there are more stunts here, and Bond's in a new location, and I don't like the way women are treated again in bikinis. It's a throwback to the 60s mentality, but so what? It's summertime, James Bond is with us, a lot of new stunts, especially one at the end of the picture. There is a stunt with Bond strapped to the back of an airplane. That is one of the greatest things you'll ever see in a movie, as far as stunts are concerned. Fighting on top of an yeah, airplane. Yeah, that alone is worth the price of admission. So, yeah, throw aside any high standards of in, anything intellectual here, and just have a good time at the movie. Well, a certain exhaustion, I think, sets into a series when you have 13 movies, and the way they fought that exhaustion in the other films is by making them bigger, throwing in more gadgets, even going into space. But the nice thing about Octopussy is that it's gone back to the basics. Less gadgetry, more hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. It's more of an adventure movie in a more traditional sense, and I like it for that reason. Loads of fun. And speaking about going back to the basics, Neil. Besides talking about new movies, from time to time, we'll be taking a quick look back at some of the history of the movie business. To put things in perspective, Hollywood has preserved many of its oldest films, but it hasn't saved some of the oldest places where those films were made. Now that's changing. In a park beside the Hollywood Bowl, one of the movie's oldest landmarks has finally found a permanent home. It all began right here. This was a barn that two New York filmmakers, Jesse Lasky and Cecil B. DeMille, rented back in 1913 and converted into the first real studio in Hollywood. The movie they shot here was called The Squaw Man. And there's a story that after they shot the film and projected it on the barn wall, the image kept on flickering. So they took the print to Philadelphia and a clever movie producer named Sigmund Lubin. Lubin corrected the problem and saved the first feature of the company that would later become Paramount Pictures. is going to house the Hollywood Studio Museum, which is scheduled to open later this year. I guess the odd thing is that it's taken 70 years for the motion picture community out here to establish any monument to its own history. While other nations have beautiful cinema texts and museums, the Hollywood film industry has shown very little historical consciousness. There's a lot of motion picture history here, and it's fortunate that some people, at least, are finally recognizing that, before the artifacts and the monuments like this one are lost. Now that barn was actually moved down the street in the fall of 1982 and located where it is now outside the Hollywood Bowl. But the museum itself is scheduled to open sometime later this year and we'll keep you apprised of, of the later developments. Well, now let's summarize how we felt about the films we reviewed. We disagreed on Psycho 2, the sequel to the Hitchcock thriller. Jeffrey thought it was more campy than scary and doesn't compare to the first Psycho, while I thought it didn't try to compare and it was a suspenseful, high-class drive-in movie. So one no and one yes. We disagree again on Trading Places, the new comedy with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Jeffrey felt that its gimmick of Aykroyd and Murphy trading places was worked to death but that the movie was still funny. I found it slowly paced, and except for Murphy, more amusing than funny. We do agree, however, on To Begin Again, the Academy Award-winning Spanish melodrama about a dying man rekindling an old romance. We both felt that it should have been moving, but that it never established any feeling between the man and his old girlfriend. So two knows. And we agree again on Octopussy, the new James Bond adventure. It may be slow at times, but it's got all the action and entertainment you expect from a Bond movie. So the big one we agree on this week is 007, James Absolutely. Bond and Octopussy. Have okay. a good time, go to see it. I agree. Next time, we'll look at the latest exploits of the Man of Steel, for Superman 3 is about to sweep into theaters. To see if he's still faster than a speeding bullet, 
and can still leap tall buildings with a single bound, join us next time on Sneak Previews. And until then, avoid kryptonite and save us the aisle seats. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.